No. We we will, but as long as GOL doesn't debate while those counselors are there, um, if we just trader okay. as a sponsor and not uh, deliberate. Okay. Yeah. All right. We've done that in TSO as long as okay. we're just asking questions. All right. So seeing the presence of a quorum, um, I'm going to call this meeting of governance organization legislation to order um, on November 18, according to my watch. Actually, what does my watch say? It's 10.33. Um, and pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of open meeting law, this meeting of GOL um, is being conducted by remote participation and we are being recorded. I'm gonna check to make sure everybody can hear and be heard, um, starting with the uh, committee members and start with Lynn this morning, Lynn? Yes. Okay, Andy. Yes. Thank you, Pat? Yes. Mandy? Yes. Very good, okay. Um, I see also two sponsors. I'm just gonna check and make sure they can be heard. Um, so uh, Matthew, if you could unmute. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Matthew. And Michelle? Yes. All right. I see also two counselors present. They are co-sponsors of a resolution we'll be taking up in just a moment. And so Shalini? Yes. Thank you, and Alyssa? Yes. All right, very good. And of course, Emily is here taking notes, taking the uh, uh, minutes. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. um, before we launch into our meeting, I wanna just go over the agenda briefly with my colleagues. Um, I think my understanding, Lynn, is that you do have uh, a version of the uh, timeline or no, is that? Um, I do, just hold on. That's all right. And is it something you'd like us, because we're perfectly, it's on the agenda, it's item number two, we're gonna move it anyway, but we are, we okay. will take it up at some point this morning is my plan, if that's okay with you. Okay, so you don't need to put, yeah. Okay, so here's the agenda. And um, so uh, because we do have a resolution that was uh, sent to us uh, by the president of the council and then referred to us automatically through the council, um, I have invited the sponsors to be present this morning. And as is our custom, we tend to do this at the start of the meeting so they don't have to sit through um, all the very exciting stuff we do normally. Um, and so I was going to make that our first agenda item. And then I would go back to the order of the agenda. Item two would be a continued discussion of the town manager evaluation process. Um, and then we have a third item that I would like to take up next has to do with the um, uh, recent development with the FinCom. Um, and then we would go back to the, the, the agenda as it's ordered here. Um, so unless there's a uh, concern about that, and I don't see anyone raising their hand or looking upset. So if that's okay with you all, that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to begin with the um, resolution that's been referred to us. And so if we could get that up on the screen, um, we can begin our review of that resolution. So um, this resolution is titled at the moment, a resolution affirming the town of Amherst commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents. And as you can see, it's, it's sponsored by counselors, Paul Min, Paul Mellon, Brewer and DeAngelis, all three who are present this morning and also two resident sponsors um, who are also present. Um, and in the process of this review, we invite everyone to participate. So um, the idea is that um, where we have concerns, questions, suggested changes, um, we look to the sponsors to see what their thoughts are. And the goal is to achieve some kind of uh, unanimity um, so that we can then proceed to vote on it um, as a committee. So that's the process. We tend to go through it um, basically section by section. Um, and each uh, member then is invited to raise any questions or concerns and the sponsors um, should feel free to, to weigh in if there are questions, concerns, or if they wish to make any changes themselves. So those are kind of the basic ground rules. This committee does not 
discuss the merits of a resolution. This is not a place for us to say whether we agree or disagree or how we might vote or not vote. This is a focus, this committee looks clearly, focuses on the idea of clarity um, in terms of just the language, consistency within the document and actionability insofar as it um, requires um, or asks that the council do something. Um, we also look to see that that's something that, that actually could be done. So clarity, consistency, and actionability are the three criteria that we apply. Um, and we try pretty successfully to steer away from uh, the merits, uh, what we personally think about the resolution. So is that, uh, that's kind of the basic procedure that we follow and the rules that govern what we do. Okay. Uh, I have a hand up, is that right? Or Andy, I'm sorry. My hand up. Go ahead, please. Yeah, the reason I raised my hand, and, um, and this has nothing to do with merits because I, I absolutely agree with the uh, thrust of the resolution. Uh, it seems awfully long. And um, I was wondering what the intended purpose of the resolution is uh, because uh, its length in and of itself may confuse um, a lot of readers or lose a lot of readers. Uh, and uh, it, if it's, you know, is it educational? Is it a statement of intended policy? It may be trying to do too much. And um, so I, I just want, um, a little bit concerned when you get into clarity that it doesn't have clarity because it, um, because of its length, you kind of get lost in it. And that was my reaction when I first read it the very first time, which is what most you're going to, what the purpose is, if somebody picks up a resolution and reads it, that they, they get it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. All right, I'm going to ask people to use the raise hand function as much as possible. I do have my screen open so I can see that, um, which is good. And Andy did that, which is very good. If uh, if I'm ignoring you, you can also just wave your hand. Um, but I do have it open. And I guess the first question that might begin our discussion is for the sponsors, if uh, anyone wants to take it up, which if they could um, address the issue of the length and also of the intent of this resolution. I was wondering if uh, Matthew or Michelle might start off by answering this. Okay, fair enough. Um, Matthew, please go ahead. Well, so there's two questions, right? One is the length and the other is the purpose. Yes. Um, and, the pur and the purpose is just one thing, but education is definitely a big part of it. And the reason for the length has to do with that educational purpose. Um, as you can see, there's a number of very specific historical facts included in the resolution. And uh, there was, you know, in order to convey <clears throat> the depth of the actual reality of the town, you know, I, I don't know if this is, well, yeah. In order to convey the depth of it, I mean, it's it's actually fairly concise given what's behind it, given all the incidents that aren't listed here. We really tried to pick and choose things that were the most impactful and that could really convey. We wanted to lay out, you know, what is the actual past historical reality of this town's involvement with structural racism. So I would say as far as the length, that educational purpose is the thing that contributes the most to its length. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanna to add to that. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think uh, we had a hunch that we were going to uncover quite a bit of historical data. And I don't think our hunch even came close really to what we did uncover, which is actually very fa is fascinating. Um, I'll add that we have close to a 10 page document actually that goes with this that includes, uh, you know, 
a lot more depth. Um, so as Matthew said, we tried to uh, parse out what was what we thought was important and include a timeline. Um, but it does, I agree, it does make it a lengthy document. And I can see how reading it from, you know, we were sort of in it, but if you're just coming into it and reading it, I can see where it might be um, where you could get a little lost, especially on that first read. It's a lot, it's also a lot to take in. Um, so I think we have to be sensitive to that, that it's a very, it's, it's, um, it's sensitive information and it's a lot to take in. So yeah, I, I think that's all that I have to add, but the educational component is definitely sort of what we were trying to, uh, you know, uh, accomplish in that first, in the whereas portion. Um, speaking to the purpose, I would add to the education piece, which is definitely an important piece. And I think many people that I've spoken to are ambiguous about, well, did that really happen in Amherst? Does it really exist right now? And so part of it is like, yeah, historically, this is how it's been. And also currently, this is where the gaps, uh, some of the gaps, and because of lack of data, which is another whole story, but at least based on what we know, this is where it is. The second purpose I think is also speaking to the national level and um, the fact that racism does exist. And I think it's important locally for towns, all towns to make that statement collective, in, you know, individually, collectively for the rhetoric to change nationally as well. So I think it, go, it goes and speaks to that aspect as well. Pat? Oh. Pat Sorry. Was, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I, I want to add I, the length uh, is this educational piece. Um, but the purpose of the bylaw to me is Amherst looking at itself, reflecting on its history, uh, its political history, its policies, and apologizing for those things, and then committing to doing work to become anti-racist. So part of the intention of this is to commit the council uh, to participate in uh, anti-racism trainings. It is to, um, look at what kind of remedy might we want to have for the actions, our historical actions and our current actions. Um, and it really, yeah, so those, I want to add those. So it isn't just that, well, this is educational because we could have left it a proclamation. Um, and so I think it's very important that we look on at the action steps that we're asking the uh, council to take and the community to take. Okay. I think um, that helps me get a clear sense of uh, the purpose. Um, it sounds like there's an educational uh, component, a kind of um, factual record being presented. Um, there is the goal of, of connecting this to the larger national conversation, the national events that have been taking place uh, starting, well, that have been occurring. Um, and then it seems there's also um, uh, the purpose is to commit the council to um, certain action steps. Is that a fair summary of what the sponsors would say is the um, purpose of this resolution, and that also then um, is part of the response to Andy's question about its length. Shalini. Yeah, I just want to add to what Pat had said about acknowledging and apologizing in addition to, I think that's an important okay. first step to acknowledge that's happened and we apologize and then actions we can take. Thank you. Okay, all right, so apology, um, so kind of formal Council apology on behalf of the town, and then a commitment to action steps. Um, Alyssa. 
So I'm trying to take a step back here a little bit and not tell you why the resolution itself is a good idea, which I think we've already strayed into, which has been really difficult for us to parse that out to as we, as we follow this process, is it's, you gave a great summary of this, George, but that also included reasons to vote for this or not at the town council level, which I know we're not actually doing now. So in terms of us trying to meet GOL standards, we looked over all of GOL's guidance documents, which were incredibly helpful and helped us figure out where we were on the continuum from proclamation and resolution back again and then back again in terms of where we're at. And I think that the length of this, which was one of the original questions here is to not why this is a good idea to do this or not, but whether or not it meets GOL's criteria, is that I understand completely that it feels uncomfortable to GOL to have it be so long in terms of the other kinds of things that we've tried to do um, that, you know, that GOL has, has reviewed on behalf of the town council. So I think the rationale that people have just provided is excellent, not only for why we're doing this in general, but also for why it is that supports this structure. So that's what I'm trying to get at. The, all those reasons actually support this structure as opposed to a shorter document. And as you heard, there is going to be an accompanying document, but rather than making this even shorter and saying, okay, well, can you keep it to a page and then put all the rest in the accompanying information? It just felt like it took too much out in terms of getting people to the thought process that will then get them to the additional information it felt like it would be too generic to try and keep it short and put everything in a separate document. And so I ask of GOL, which, you know, has been doing this for a couple of years now and has developed some, some really helpful guidelines to consider that we are uncomfortably having to do things differently in some areas. We did things differently associated with the community safety working group. We're doing things differently associated with this. And so I appreciate that you don't have like an 800 character limit or something that says that's where you have to end up. And we worked really hard to keep it within, your, within the GOL criteria because we thought the GOL criteria made sense, but still felt compelled to give this many examples and this much education to get to the point of not just having this be a generic feel good sort of proclamation. Okay. Um, speaking for myself, I think we're still well within the GOL parameters here. Um, so the length, we don't have a, as you mentioned, Alyssa, we don't have a character limit or anything like that. Um, I think generally speaking, as Andy suggested, when we look at a resolution, um, we do get concerned about length from the point of view of making sure that it's easily graspable by the public as well as by the council. But there's no uh, set length. Um, so I think that was the spirit in which he was raising the question. And then that also leads us to what the sponsors you all have done, which is help us understand uh, the intent and purpose of this document um, because that then addresses the question of clarity and consistency. Um, so um, I don't know about the others, but speaking for myself, um, I, I feel comfortable right now with where we're at in terms of you know, the way we work. Um, it helps us to get clear with any resolution that uh, is being presented um, what the intent or purpose is so that we can then make some kind of informed judgment about its clarity and about its consistency. So if the intent is X, Y, and Z, and there's a passage in there that seems to either um, say something else or muddy that or whatever, then we might raise a question, not from the point of view of uh, the uh, you know, deliberation, but from the point of view is, is this consistent or is this clear given the stated purpose that you or purposes that you are trying to accomplish? And I think at the end of that discussion, uh, it's perfectly possible that someone might still uh, disagree with this document and vote against it but certainly approve it in terms of being clear, consistent, and actionable. So that's my sense at the moment. My colleagues are welcome to weigh in, but um, I think we are well within the, the, the parameters of what we do. Um, the question of length, Andy's raised sure. it. I'm sorry, I, I, anyone's got their hand up? 
Yeah, I can't raise my hand because I'm co-hosting. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lynn. So, um, on the second page, in the second whereas, there is a a mistake, um, and I'm I don't have the data to correct it, but it says or about 0.001% of the student body. Um, that would have meant that at that time, UMass had 50,000 students and um, I, it didn't have that. And the other thing is this is not stated as a percent, it's stated as the decimal for multiplying with a percent. So we just need to rapidly find out how many students were at UMass in 1966, and then figure out what that percent is. Good, I think, um, Lynn, what I'd like to do with permission of my colleagues is uh, what we normally do, which is go at whereas by whereas, uh, section by section, and um, make sure that people are satisfied or if they have any questions or concerns, but that one is noted. And when we get to it, we'll note it again. Um, but unless, so I guess right now, I'm just wondering, anyone have any further comments about the larger issue of length? Is this something that, that others feel is, is uh, I think it's been answered and responded to. Um, so unless there's further concern about that, um, we've also had it clearly stated now, um, the basic overall purpose and intent of the, of the resolution. Again, if there are any questions about that. So I see Andy's hand up, Andy. Yeah, I'll be real quick because I think uh, you're right. We should just go on and um, work through um, the sections as we normally do. And at the conclusion of it, uh, it might be something that um, I would suggest to the sponsors is that they then try it out on a couple of people who have never seen it before and just not with the idea, just sort of what did you get out of it and what do you think of it and see if their reaction is, you know, what the reaction is. So I'd say let's go on. Okay. It's an interesting suggestion, Andy. We'll see what the sponsors make of it at the end. But um, so I'm going to then suggest we proceed section by section. Um, my usual custom is to read each section out loud um, as we go through it and then see if there are any comments, questions, or concerns. I see Pat's hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly say that uh, one of the first resolutions that GOL worked on was about uh, supporting abortion rights, the right to choose, the, the Roe Act. And that was rather lengthy uh, and I think longer than this. But uh, again, everything contributed to the final um, resolution um, or, or uh, intention. So we will look at that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so first of all, the title, a resolution affirming the town of Amherst commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents. Any concerns about the title? Any questions? Okay. Um, I would just note that it would seem that I'm in the George. purpose. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, I put my Mandy's hand up. Game. Thank oh. you, Mandy. Sorry. <laughs> um, and and I don't know. I, I'm trying not to stray into. Um, I know yeah. that, but achieve racial equity for Black residents, and I I have a concern about the title. I understand the purpose of it, um, but from a prior actions of the council. Um, does it, you know, and this is why I, I'm trying not to stray, does it get too specific? You know, is this something that our other BIPOC residents of the town would read and get concerned about that we're not seeking to achieve racial equity for them too? Um, and I don't know whether that's more of a substantive matter or a consistency given prior actions of town council in terms of resolutions or not, but but mm -hmm. it is something that I wanted to bring up. And it might not be for GOL to discuss. Well, I think it does bring us to back to the question of the purpose of this uh, resolution and the title would seem to suggest, at least to me, the purpose is specifically addressed of this resolution to our black residents. Um, the, the issue of racial equity 
because it concerns the black residents of Amherst. So I guess for the sponsors, the question is just again, a question of purpose. Um, and I think the answer is clear, but I need to, I guess, hear it because I think that Mandy, you're raising it. Um, is the purpose of this resolution uh, solely focused on the issue of structural racism as it relates to our black residents? And I see Matt's hand up. The simple answer is yes. We intentionally focused very specifically on one thing, uh, just to keep focus, to keep, um, you know, there's there's a lot of, once, once you kind of open to the possibility of um, racial equity for everyone, there's, you think it's long now, <laughs> but it would have been a lot longer. So we really were just trying to, it, it, we're not in any way saying that this is the only thing the town council should ever do when, in, with regard to racial equity, but we're saying this is what we are supporting and bringing forward at this moment in a focused way. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, any other comments, concerns about the title? Okay, um, I'm going to read this out loud and uh, at some point I may have others do the reading, but my voice is still intact. Whereas the city known as the town of Amherst embraces its racial diversity and seeks to continue to implement policies and procedures that address racial equity and social justice issues, I take it that's right, and social justice issues consistent with the town council resolution in the aftermath of the murder of Mr. George Floyd adopted on June 1, 2020 that one, ensure all community members feel and are part of Amherst and feel they are protected, listened to, and served by their public servants, comma, two, foster a community free of fear, intimidation, and violence, comma, and three, incorporate significant involvement of BIPOC residents in shaping these policies and procedures. That is the first whereas. Uh, I see two hands. Mandy, we'll start with you. I apologize for how much I'm going to be talking. That's um, quite all right. That's what the we do. The title, the resolution title, I think the A in aftermath and the M in murder should be capitalized because the title was resolution in the aftermath of the murder of Mr. George Floyd. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Mandy, are you, I forgot to ask this at the top of the, <laughs> are you doing, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> she's, she has been very helpful in this thank you. aftermath of the murder of Mr. George Floyd. Okay. Um, any other comments, Mandy, before I go to Andy? Not, not from me on that paragraph. Okay. okay. Andy. Hey, um, I guess I have three things. One is that um, if for the uh, sake of brevity, I would not count the city known as just go start of where's the town of Amherst. <laughs> Second is that um, I looked for the uh, a resolution on June 1st, 2020 in the council packet for that date, and I did not find this resolution. I know we passed a resolution, but I didn't find it in the June 1, 2020 packet. So I was a little bit, I just wanted to make sure that somebody's double checking the date on that. Um, and uh, a third thing, actually a fourth thing, the third thing I have about it is that I find that first sentence to be really long and would suggest that yeah. you it would improve if you had a period after June 1, 2020, and then a second sentence that says that resolution and then goes on with uh, grammatically correct language uh, ensures all community residents if you're going to do that way um, do what I suggest but I think the great the second sentence will help the readers um, and then the, okay, the last Andy? thing that I had, okay. you want me to stop or no, go no. to the last thing I, th I thought it sounded like someone was you're under attack there for a moment but um, no why don't we why don't you finish your thought I'm sorry and, and the, the last thing that I spotted in this one is that I guess that I need to have, um, I, I will admit to my own ignorance of what is intended by 
using the term BIPOC and any of my colleagues who want to or any participants want to help out. But I had assumed that BIPOC was to be more inclusive than just Black, um, that it was, uh, and of course it came up quite a bit in the policing discussion. Um, and uh, so in the very last sentence and actually throughout, if it's about Black residents, should it be saying Black residents or should, um, or, or is BIPOC really an appropriate term? Does it, um, does it solely identify, does it stick to consistent? Uh, just let me interrupt for a second. Um, people may need to uh, mute themselves until, um, and that includes me, um, but um, we've got some noise in the background that is, at least for me, is coming through very loud and clear and makes it hard to hear Andy. So um, if you would kindly mute yourselves um, and then when you uh, recognize you, um, you can unmute. I'm sorry about that, but um, this is, this is going to be a difficult, or it's going to be a complicated slug. And we need to be able to hear everybody clearly. So, Andy, again, I'm sorry if you um, you've raised a couple of issues here, Andy. Um, the first, let me start with the first one in terms of normally my understanding is we like to keep each whereas to a single sentence. So when I see two sentences, I immediately want to do something to either uh, create two separate whereases or somehow find a way to clearly connect the first and second sentence. So it's one thought. In other words, each whereas should be ideally, in my understanding a single clear, it may be long, it may be you know, multiple lines. And here I think there is one thought, which is that the town of Amherst's commitment to implement policies and procedures that address the racial equity and social justice, I'd like to strike the word issues um, and just say racial equity and social justice consistent with the resolution. Um, so uh, we're embracing and seeking to implement policies and procedures that address this issue consistent with um, a town policy, a town council resolution, and then the, the, the remainder of it simply articulates that resolution. So I would resist, at least at the moment, it is a long sentence and there is a clarity question, but I would try to resist creating two sentences here, but let it go as one long sentence. I would strike the word issues, however, if that makes it a little bit clearer. Um, and then uh, Andy raised the question of whether this in fact was uh, we just need to check um, the nice. June one. I'm sorry. It was okay. So that it is there, and um, the language here, the items one, two, and three, are either a direct or very clear paraphrase of that resolution. Is that correct? So ensure all community members feel they're part of Amherst and feel they're protected. I take it that's language taken from or very closely based on the resolution. I'm checking the resolution right now. Right, because I think that would be important that. This is not new language. It's essentially language that um, either directly taken from it or very closely paraphrases what the council resolution was on June 1, 2020. And if that's the case, then this is one single thought. It's a little long, but I think I would keep it as one single. If you break it into two, it's uh, anyway, I, other colleagues here, Andy, you still have your hand up. Why don't you respond? That's a residual hand, Andy. Go ahead. Andy, you need to unmute. You still need to unmute, Andy. I don't think I have the power to unmute him. Can the host unmute him? <laughs> I can do that. Hold on. Thank you. No, no, I can't. You want to let you do it? Yeah, I, hold on. That's all right. Um, so I mean, this is one of the advantages of not having to do mute and unmute. <laughs> um, many okay, things have come. Um, go there ahead. you go. Okay. Uh, I think I may have not gotten across what I was just saying. Sorry. Um, I just, uh, the, as far as there are other whereas clauses that are in this document, that's been presented to us that have multiple sentences. So I guess that we, it's sort of hard <laughs> to know this unless we're consistent um, throughout. 
Um, I went for consistency based on the fact that there were other sentences or other whereas clauses with multiple sentences. Um, and uh, I find that um, if our purpose is to just get this um, into so that it's clear that if um, that, that it may be that multiple sentences within a single whereas clause is, is more clear than trying to break it into multiple uh, uh, even more whereas clauses where they tie together in this one it's all about our prior resolution and uh, so that's why I would consider doing it as two sentences just to make it readable. I also want to just say in looking at the actual resolution I'm Pat you wrote the resolution and I'm looking at it right now I can't find the words that you've used here. I took those from the um, letter that went out. I would, I will check that. I have to. Okay, so in other words, it was not part of the actual resolution. Uh, that, that's what I have to check. I apologize. Um, I thought taking it from the uh, letter would, would be enough and I was wrong. Um, so that has to be checked. I also wanna, if I may, George, um, I wanna go back with the other sponsors to look at racial equity for black residents because there are, and we, this is a discussion that we had and we, we decided to go here, but we do reference BIPOC community elsewhere and I think that if we had a sentence that clarified why we're using this particular history, um, knowing that the similar actions and policies and impacts have happened to other people uh, in the BIPOC community, uh, I would be more comfortable, but that's a discussion. Um, we'll have with your sponsors, yeah. 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 I mean, I would, I would agree the point of view of consistency that that's something that you need to think about when you have in the title, black residents, and then you make reference to BIPOC residents in the document. Right. There does seem to be an issue there, and just in terms of consistency and also clarity for people reading this, who might who raise the very understandable question: Well, is this about our African American residents, our Black residents, or is this about the BIPOC community as a whole? And um, so, I think there's a consistency and clarity issue that Andy raised with that in item number three, um, and there is the question of. You know, again, this is the sponsors are free to disagree. You're free to say, no, 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 we want to keep it this way. Um, and then, you know, because this is a, a, a joint enterprise, but there is the issue that's raised that uh, the feeling I think of the committee is that at least members have expressed so far that items one, sub items one, two, and three here should closely track the language of the uh, cited resolution on June 1, 2020. So those are two suggestions. I'm still going to defend, um, and this is a, now you get to see insider baseball, I'm still going to defend um, my idea that each whereas should be a single thought. Um, one larger thought that holds it together, and if you have multiple thoughts, um, multiple uh, claims, you should, you should separate it out. And here I think there is one thought, is my sense of reading this. Um, uh, I have Alyssa and then I have Matthew. So Alyssa, please. Also, Michelle had her hand up. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I, I don't. But not on the uh, screen. I don't have a way to do that on my end. I don't see a hand. I, I uh, normally do, but for some reason today I don't. So. Okay. Yeah, I see. You have to Michelle, open but... the participant window to okay. show the participants, and then you should get the button. All right. You have to scroll down. Oh, raise hand. I do see it now. Thank okay, you. Good. All right. <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to start with Alyssa and then um, Matthew and then Michelle. Alyssa, please. So. The way we fix the error in the um, the section that Mandy Joe highlighted is we just remove it. It didn't belong there in the first place. It should not have been taken from the letter. It should only have been taken from the resolution. And that was my mistake for not catching that sooner. It was that was just okay. wrong. And so it should just end at adopted on June 1, 2020. And okay. and in terms of that concern about BIPOC and anti-Black and Black, and we have struggled with this 
a lot through the resolution of this. And it's really good to hear that that's still not obvious to people who haven't been in it like we have been. And Andy's suggestion is well taken about um, even more people than we've already run it by should, should look at it. But in terms of a statement that says why we're talking, we say very clearly two, two whereases from now, this resolution addresses anti-Black racism in particular. And it is noted that much more work is needed to address the impact of racism on other groups. So that's where we're at. So if, as we go through this, somebody says, hey, you know, this would make so much more sense if you put that in, you know, paragraph one, that's cool. That's where we ended up putting it, but we did put it in here because we knew that concern was there and trying to walk that line as Matthew described is very difficult. I also see this as, you know, the sponsors brought this forward town council can act on this and then town council could very reasonably say at town council's discussion hey that's cool that the sponsors brought us this and that's one step and now as a town council we're going to ask one of our town council committees to work on some more stuff because this just shows us that this is just one particular aspect i have a quick thought uh Alyssa, you might again this is for the sponsors to consider you might consider moving that paragraph you just alluded to up to right after the to make it the second whereas so it addresses that issue right at the top um at the moment it comes sort of not quite in the middle but comes after a number of other items again you may decide that you want to keep it where it is but i would suggest if um that you consider moving it and putting it in position number two um, if that makes sense. And then you go into the series of, of whereases that start with a general acknowledgement and then there's a general historical, um, right? There's a logic to it, I think, from then on. Um, so just a suggestion, you might consider moving it up um, in position number two. Um, I see, Alyssa, your hand's still up, but that may be residual. I just wanted to say that, yeah, it is in the George Floyd thing is on page um, three of our packet from June 1st. Okay. So um, we're still working with, and this is how it goes, by the way, for those of you in the audience or those of you who are doing this for the first time, uh, it can, it goes sometimes slowly, but I hope ultimately very valuably for everyone. Are we still on the first whereas? And we've made a number of changes that you see on the screen. Um, and I see Alyssa's hand still up. Um, so Alyssa, if you, okay, that's all right then. Um, any other comments? So at the moment, um, this could be, we could move on from this unless there's further thoughts or concerns. And also important that the sponsors are comfortable with it. Um, okay. George, could I make a suggestion? Um, given that we're on the first whereas and there may end up being a lot of suggested changes that yep. we as a GOL uh, are likely not to vote on this today, um, that we can make our suggestions, we can leave them here and then the sponsors can bring this back to the December 1 GOL meeting um, after they can discuss it. Um, and then maybe that would still be in enough time to meet the December 7, our next council meeting. Um, so it wouldn't even delay it to a different council meeting. And it, we'd just then be looking at a cleaner one. Mm -hmm. I have no issue with that. Um, but we'll see how many changes uh, uh, take place. But if, if yes, I think that would not be an unreasonable request by GOL um, if we feel that we need to have a second go at this. Um, and hopefully the sponsors will agree, but we'll see where we're at at the end of this. Um, second whereas, the town of Amherst recognizes that there is an escalation of hatred, bigotry, and overt racism in our country. Okay, any comments? I, I see Andy, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, this is a question for the sponsors. I have no objection to it staying there. Uh, we have quite a history in this country of racism. And uh, George and I are both reading the same book that, um, uh, as, as uh, it turns out, that's unrelated, but it talks about um, you can trace racism well back before the country was a country. And uh, 
So escalation becomes a uh, interesting word because uh, when you think about lynching and everything else as you go through um, what that history has been, uh, escalation is really quite a, um, in, um, from a historian's point of view, an interesting choice of word. And um, so I would encourage the sponsors to think about whether that's the word that they really want, but I don't think it's a clarity question. Um, so I don't, um, you know, I'm not going to object to it being there, but I, that was my reaction. Okay. So a question about the word escalation. Uh, Pat, I said, wait, well, Pat, your hand just went down. Pat, your hand went back up. Now it went down again. <laughs> Pat, I'm going to call on you just in case. I, I, I'm unsure about why I, I'm not understanding uh, Andy's concern with the word escalation because right now we're not lynching the way we were before, but we're dragging black folks behind trucks. We're shooting them for carrying Skittles. We're, and so that, or maybe it uh, is a continuation of the hatred, bigotry, and overt racism in our country. But it seems to me we are escalating, particularly right now, given the president that we've had and the resurgence of active uh, blatant white racism and s white supremacy in the country. So I, I'm, I'm just unclear what, I don't know. I'm not sure what, why escalation bothers you, but. Well, well I think Andy, what Andy is, is he just, he's just asking the sponsors to consider use of the term and that's what you're doing right now. And you may want to, I mean, your response at the moment is you have no problem with it, it seems. Uh, it's not an issue that, um, of that's, uh, he's not asking for a change. He's just suggesting that you consider whether this is the word you want. And the answer seems to be at the moment, Michelle, why don't you speak to this? But it seems to be, yes, this is the word you want. Michelle? Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, while Andy was speaking, it did resonate for me what he was saying. Um, and the word that comes to mind for me, and I know that this isn't necessarily the place to discuss, but I just want to say that it's more to me an awakening. Um, there certainly is an escalation, but when you look mm. the long history um, and the lynching and, and all of the atrocities, I think what's happening is that we're awakening to um, this racism that has once been, uh, you know, hidden um, for many people, at least that's my experience. So I appreciate you making note of that. Um, and, and I think that is something worth uh, the sponsors discussing. So thank you. I think the, what, again, just from the point of view of clarity and what you're saying, these are two very different thoughts. And I guess that, that will require the sponsors to consider it. Um, one is acknowledging what I think um, many would certainly agree has been renewed incidents uh, of, of racism, hatred, and bigotry. And then the other is um, making a somewhat different point and the language is important. So um, I wouldn't necessarily give up on the first thought, um, nor would I say um, the second thought is, is, uh, should be rejected either, but this is your call. Um, it's about what you're trying to say. And so you might wanna consider it um, Mandy suggested is put an awakening to the hatred, bigotry, and overt racism in our country. And that is maybe the thought that you want. Um, that's not the thought that was in this, whereas initially. Um, so it's two different thoughts. Um, I guess our suggestion at the moment is you want to think about it and then come back to us uh, with which um, you prefer. Um, that's the thought I have. Shalini? Yeah, I actually want to acknowledge Andy's question. I think that was a really good one, made me think about it. But I do want to clarify, uh, I read a historian's perspective on this and he looked after slavery though, and all the different presidents, if there has, the, if Trump is indeed the most racist. And the fact is that he, he had, the conclusion of that article was that he has been more racist and has 
amped up the rhetoric around racism. And so it has escalated. I think escalated is indeed the right word for that. But like you suggested, we can talk about it separately and I appreciate uh, Michelle's point about awakening, which I think is a separate point. Alyssa? I think it's important that we either, we keep the note absolutely that Mandy Jo wrote, but we take out the word awakening unless we say white because it's not like black people haven't recognized this. It's not like brown people haven't recognized this. Yes, white people are finally paying attention in a different way than they have been before. So throw, <laughs> thanks Mandy Jo, throw the word white in there and we'll keep percolating it. But um, just wanted to be clear, thanks so much for the, the being able to edit this on, it, on the move to help us look at this more carefully is really great. So thank you. Ditto. Okay, um, I see two hands still up, but I think the residual. So unless uh, uh, that's not the case, you should speak up. I'm gonna move on to the next whereas. Um, whereas for the town of Amherst to fully embrace the changes necessary to move our community forward, it is necessary to acknowledge and apologize for its own history of discrimination and racial injustice. Mandy. Yeah, so this was originally two sentences. So that's why I raised my hand because it, I've split it up because of the previous discussion about potentially moving the second sentence up. I went through and split all the single sentences, but so I guess this one, I would add the semicolon and my comment more goes to the second half of this that is now a new whereas. Um, I would reword it um, to, um, I'll just read my rewording. While this resolution addresses anti-Black racism in particular, the town of Amherst acknowledges that much more work is needed to address the impact of racism on other groups. Um, you know, it's more of a active than passive and it's, it's us noting, not a passive someone noting. Um, I can type that language into the draft here if, if people are uh, like it. I think you could certainly type in your suggestion um, and then the group, the sponsors can, uh, as they did with the previous item, can ponder it. They may have some comments now, but they may also um, want to think about it and discuss it. Um, our goal here in part is to help the sponsors uh, articulate clearly and consistently uh, the message they are trying to communicate. So that's that's the spirit in which we do this. Um, it's not criticism. It's not, hopefully it's not um, deliberation or commentary. I don't think we strayed into that area at all, but in sense of getting clear on exactly what the sponsors are trying to say, um, we might offer as we just did here with Mandy suggestions and these can be um, rejected, ignored or incorporated or whatever else by the sponsors and you don't need to do this right at this moment, but you're welcome to do that. Um, and you're certainly welcome to say, we don't want any changes made, um, but I'm suggesting that Mandy's suggestion be put into the document for further consideration, either now or at a later date. Um, Pat. And Pat, you need to unmute yourself, I'm sorry. Unmute yourself. Lo siento, lo siento. Um, I, what I saw was all the sponsors had their thumbs up. So I think that we are accepting and, and, and are grateful for Mandy's change. Good. So I'd like to have it there. Good. Um, I just want to be clear to yeah, the sponsors you, that, that when you get this back, it, it looks like uh, given the number of changes that are probably going to be made, you're going to want to sit down with this and go through yeah. it. Um, you're perfectly free to do whatever you want with it. Um, these are just suggestions. Um, and, and um, yeah. can I, I just want to say a little bit, I really hear that. And I know that from working on this committee that this is not about uh, whether you agree or disagree. It is about what's making it clearer, what's making it better writing, what's making it more impactful. And so I don't think you need to keep stressing that. I think that we know that from you and the committee. Thank you. Further concerns, comments about this, whereas. 
Um, do we want to discuss or do you want to leave this for later, the movement of any of these? Maybe that's something we want to take up on, uh, the sponsors want to take up later. But um, do you have any thoughts about moving some of this? Um, or maybe you're happy with the way it is at the moment. In other words, in terms of the flow, in terms of um, how it reads so far. Um, I see Michelle's hand. Michelle, please. Yeah, I really liked the suggestion of moving the, while this resolution addresses anti-Black racism up quite like to the top, essentially. Um, so I, I just wanna put that on record that I appreciate that suggestion. I think okay. for me, it does help clarify things um, in a, where we can start in that place and then move from there, so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, I will just say for the purposes of, of just mm -hmm. doing the GOL sort of thing, it's always nice to begin with a reference to a specific town council action before you get into that's my personal preference for these sorts of things connecting it directly to something the council has done or said is very valuable and putting it up at the very top i think is very valuable so but again that's something just keep in mind um but i also agree that this could be moved perhaps into the second position but if you want you could also put it at the very top any other thoughts i see no hands i see no hands waving Okay, next, whereas since its inception, the town of Amherst has enacted, supported and permitted official and unofficial policies and practices that have perpetuated the fallacy of white supremacy. Now we have another sentence. Such practices have caused serious harm to black, indigenous and people of color and have fostered a persistent racial equity gap in the town. I have my hand up. Go ahead, Lynn. I, I would suggest getting rid of the phrase to black indigenous and people of color BIPOC because it just confuses the audience again. And I also feel that you can therefore um, mesh the, the second sentence into the first. Well, you know what I'm gonna say about that, but Mandy, why don't you say something different? I, I was gonna mesh by doing just what I just showed, um, practices okay. that have perpetuated um, of fallacy of white supremacy that have caused serious harm. I think that's a way to mesh. I'm I, I'm unconfused. I'm confused by what Lynn just said in terms of my editing. Would she get rid of everything that's highlighted now and go from harm to and? Um, and then my only other comment on this one was I would capitalize the T in town. Like I, would do, I would get rid of that only because, again, it just confuses the audience. So what exactly, Lynn, are you eliminating? Sorry, uh, could you repeat? So you would eliminate the phrase to Black, Indigenous, and people of color in parentheses BIPOC. Okay. So my only concern with that is that it actually unclarifies um, unofficial policies and practices in some sense, I, I guess maybe not because it's got the perpetuated by the fallacy of white supremacy, but I'm concerned about clarity by eliminating. Uh, I think, yeah, the point the is that it has caused harm. I think that seems like a central point of this, whereas that um, it's not only permitted policies, but those policies and practices have caused actual harm to people and have fostered. So I think that's a crucial part of it. Um, I don't think you can take out the harm and not change the, the part of the central meaning of this section. The question is whether um, you, again, it's the issue of Black versus the larger um, minority population. So what do you think, anybody? I see Andy's Wait. hand up. Andy? Or, I'm sorry, Mandy, did you have a response? I was Lynn? just going to say you could maybe eliminate what Lynn wants to eliminate and just say to non-white residents. Um, I'm not sure it gets the same meaning across, though. All right, that's a thought. Andy? And Andy? Um, two, two, two things, and I'll be really quick. One is, is that I think um, I really need to entrust the sponsors to decide once and for all whether they want to just have it be about uh, just say Black residents. Uh, uh, but there's if you're going to say harm 
it was harm to people. And um, so uh, people who are black, um, certainly there has been harm. And um, so I don't, I, I would not, I, I would call it out. Um, is whether you want to use BIPOC, um, again, is a policy question that I, I really do leave to the sponsors. Um, in the first time BIPOC is used, I would put in the entire definition as it is written now, because um, there are many people um, who have not experience the term. It's a relatively new term in use, and um, it, it's worth defining it the first time used if we're going to, if you're going to use it. I would echo what I think I hear Andy saying in terms of just the language here. I, first of all, yes, the term when it's used the first time should be spelled out the way it is here. And if this is the first time, then that would be fine, um, assuming it's going to be used. But secondly, I would say given the general thrust of this uh, resolution and what I've been hearing so far, that it should say has uh, supremacy have caused serious harm to black residents. Be my suggestion, it's a suggestion. I think that it should be explicit and, um, and foster the persistent racial equity gap in the town would be my suggestion. So I have two thoughts here, BIPOC should be spelled out when it's used first time and secondly, um, I would uh, suggest, uh, I think along with what Andy just suggested, that it should be explicit um, fallacy of white supremacy that um, have is correct, isn't it? I've lost the sentence now, have or has, have caused serious harm to black residents. Uh, Lynn, I think you had your hand up or you had something to say. No, I agree with that. I, I'm just, I, if we're not going to make the resolution about BIPOC, I would not bring the word BIPOC in. That's my bottom line. Okay. It's about blacks, it's about blacks. Okay. okay. That sounds like something I think the sponsors are going to continue to think and, and uh, deliberate about. Um, and from the point of view of the committee, it's simply a question of, of consistency and clarity. And we have a question about it, but um, I see Michelle's hand up. Michelle, please. Yeah, <laughs> I would just say that, you know, I think the one of the only places or maybe the only place where it really makes sense is attached somehow to this resolution addresses anti-Black racism. So to sort of qualify it in that, in that somehow um, might make sense to me now that this is so helpful, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, you know, now that we're really getting into this, it does seem like it will be much more clear if we just say black in this particular uh, paragraph. But um, I am uh, absolutely sensitive to the fact that all, you know, that as Mandy said, uh, non-white people have been harmed. And so, I think as the, a group, maybe we can figure out a way to address both. Thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I think that point has been noted and it's a very valid point. Uh, and I think as a group, we can separately figure out uh, how we're gonna deal with it. I don't think we need to discuss it right now. I think we're very clear what the issue is and, and one, by arranging sentences, getting rid of some of it, but we'll figure and we don't need to spend any more time on that over here. Points been noted. Good point, though. Alyssa. And I think partly it's a development over time issue, right? And so when we went over it and over it and over it as we continue to refine, so it's so great to have all of your eyes on this as well and the fact that you were able to read it before the meeting. Completely process boring thing. Thank goodness you guys have the ability to do this on screen with us because the version that's in your packet isn't a real PDF it's it's like a scanned image or something it's not the thing pat sent the one pat sent i can i pulled it up out of her email and i can copy and paste but i was trying to copy and paste something earlier to reflect what mandy joe said and i'm like i'm just gonna go with what mandy joe said because you can't do anything with that document that's in your packet so if you want to check with whoever uploads the stuff to your packets it's not a searchable pdf it's just some picture so um this okay. is incredibly helpful thank you 
And you're talking about the, the obviously the public, uh, right? I'm, I right. always, not SharePoint, you're talking about the public pack. The public document. Right, exactly. Public it document. is a PDF, but it's right. not one, you know, you can highlight or search or anything like that. It's okay. like a picture. Okay, okay. I will get on that. Thank Thanks. You. Okay. All right, uh, good. So the hands that are still up, if you take them down, because I assume the residual, um, I'll just make a note to the chair. At the I'll have the staff get on that. Um, whereas Massachusetts was the first county to legalize slavery in 1641. Shalini, your hand is still up. Oh, it's down, okay. Any thoughts about this? Okay, I see none, I see no way, okay. Whereas there's clear evidence that several prominent Amherst families and churches and their ministers, some of whom are memorialized in the names of streets and buildings owned African slaves and or supported and benefited from the slave trade, period. In contrast, there are no Amherst streets, parks or buildings named after black residents, semicolon and. George. Lynn. Uh, how do you wanna accommodate for the W.E.B. W -E -B du Bois Library on the UMass Amherst campus? Uh, I, that, I'm not going to accommodate it. That's something for the sponsors to, uh, to ponder. Um, my first concern is it's two sentences, so I want to get rid of that. Um, and I also wonder the connection between slave ownership um, historically and the fact that names are on uh, streets, parks, or buildings. It seems like two very, very different things. So. Um, I, I think acknowledging uh, what I seem to be a clear, indisputable historical fact that several prominent Amherst families and churches and ministers, some of whom memorialized the names of streets and buildings, owned African slaves and or support, that by itself is an important statement. And I assume in the accompanying document um, that will be uh, fleshed out. But that I think is an important acknowledgement um, and an important statement by itself. I think the next half of it, or next bit of it, um, seems in contrast somewhat, not really all that grabbing, though maybe at some point it could become part of some thought about uh, actions or so forth. So I guess I, my first observation is break it up. Second observation is I really don't see the connection between the names of streets. Um, uh, I mean, obviously it's mentioned in the, in the first part of the whereas, but um, so those are two thoughts. Let me go to my colleagues, uh, Andrew, Andy, please. Yeah, the only thing I was gonna point out is, well, it's a part of a park with the Julius Lester Trail, I know, and there may be others, so I- uh, Just as a factual, uh, this needs to be yeah, checked I, factually, I, right. Yeah, the question of- right. uh, in the trail system, the right. uh, right. conservation department manages there is right. no right. trail. I, yeah, so there's a there's a factual question with the statement about streets, parks, or buildings. Um, I see uh, Alyssa's hand up and Mandy's hand up, but Alyssa, I think you were first. Alyssa, please. So I appreciate these comments and the Julius Lester Trail is not a park. And so uh, the easiest thing in a contrast like that is to just throw it out. But then, you know, we have, the point is everybody knows there's Kendrick Park, there's Sweetser Park, there's Stanley Park. Those are parks. Having one or maybe even more than one recreation trail, which only the people who use know the names of, uh, is very different than driving by parks that have names on them. And so I appreciate that, but it is still factually correct. Julius Lester Trail is not a park. And the W.E.B. Du Bois Library is not an Amherst thing. That had nothing to do with the town of Amherst in terms of naming that. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that Mandy Jo inserted town of Amherst. Uh, Mandy Jo. Yeah, so um, once once these are split, I have a rewording. Um, so I would get rid of the words in contrast, and I would actually add 
despite the long history of civic, cultural, and economic engagement and participation of Black residents in the town of Amherst, comma, there are no town of Amherst streets, parks, or buildings named after Black residents. Just to a little sort of give a better um, mm -hmm. description mm -hmm. of what the issue is. So that's the wording I just read. Okay, so I, uh, the wording there is a suggestion, and I, uh, right? Um, yes. And I, that helps a little bit, I think, with my concern that, um, you know, the, the whereas what's striking historically, I think, and, and well worth acknowledging and um, confronting is the fact that um, there were slave owners amongst several prominent Amherst families who've been memorialized, um, I take it, in the town. That fact, it seems, is really important. Then it follows, I mean, when Mandy's suggestion here is very good because it gives a little bit more meat and a little bit more impact and maybe that's enough. But I felt just by itself, it was kind of like, you know, from just the perspective of our, you know, our black residents, uh, right, it's, yeah. So what are thoughts here, uh, Michelle, your hand is up, please. Yeah, I really like the rewording, um, but it, it also now feels like it sort of begs to be resolved or to be acted upon in a way. And so it's possible that a more proactive way to include this that also doesn't water down the very strong statement that we're making is to include it as some sort of resolution that, uh, you know, in terms of, because I think, uh, actually, I'm not sure who would have received Shalini's message, but there are some people working on this very thing to re, to, to name uh, certain areas in town. Um, so it could be something that we resolve to do or to, that the town resolves to take action to do, um, to look at. And I know there are folks working on um, you know, ideas about museums and other things like that, so. And Michelle Shalini has brought that up and it's on a list of future issues for the council. Excellent. So why not acknowledging it here though? Why is that not worth doing? Um, it, it's, um, and later we do have a, a section which deals with um, proposed actions by the council. Um, yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. I, again, you might want to think about whether I, I'm not saying you should take it out. I'm not sure Mandy's saying you should take it out. Um, in fact, she's offered a way to, to uh, reword it that I think would support it staying in. And but it could also be incorporated into a later part of the document or referenced, um, or at least this provides support for some of the suggested actions that might come later. So. Um, all right, uh, any other thoughts about this? Whereas uh, we're about an hour and 15 minutes in, um, we have a number of other things that we should do this morning. I'm not suggesting we stop, I don't think we should, but um, just wanna alert you to that fact. Um, we may not get to everything that we hope to today. So I guess my colleagues need to weigh in for a moment if that concerns them, if there's something that they absolutely, and we do have an issue with FinCom I would like to raise before we're done today. But other than that, I think everything we have could be put off. Okay. Um, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm just, and you can raise this later as we move on, but we have about, we try to end on time to respect everybody's lives. Um, so that gives us about 45 minutes. Pat, you have your hand up. And Pat, you need to unmute. I like the bell, but Pat, I don't hear your voice. Dan, I'm sorry, I apologize. It's okay. I thought I Go did for it. it, kid. Go for um, it. I would like us as sponsors the, um, to stop commenting on whether we like or don't like uh, so, because that's what we can do ourselves. And because I want to get through this document if possible so that we can have it ready. 
um, we, so that we can bring it back and have it ready for the seventh. I hear you, Pat, and I think the sponsors hear you as well. Um, there may however be specific questions we will need answered as we go along, but uh, we'll try to uh, encourage people to keep it to that. And we'll try to keep our comments um, as brief as possible, because I agree, we would like to get through this so that you can then go back and, and rework it. So I'm gonna move to the next, whereas on New Year's Day of 1762, the town selectmen ordered the first free blacks of record to leave town quote, considering them likely paupers if they were allowed to stay in Amherst's residence, unquote, and a statewide law passed in 1788 required all non-resident Blacks and Indians to leave the state of Massachusetts and forbade non-resident free Blacks from entering the state, semicolon, and. Thoughts on this, Mandy? Um, in my edits, I split this into two. I don't know whether it needs to be. I put the statewide law passed in 1788 as a separate whereas. Um, I'll make a note in the comments about that to consider splitting it in two. It doesn't need to be split in two, but I thought they were enough difference. One is town, one is state, that they might deserve different whereases. And I, I don't know my own nomenclature completely, but there are two references to Blacks in this paragraph that are not capitalized. And I don't know whether there is a point in time where prior to which you do ca don't capitalize and after which you do. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to, in this draft, capitalize them and feel free to ignore that if that nomenclature and usage is inappropriate. Okay. All right. So May is going to capitalize. I would I actually agree with that. Um, we would follow present custom, uh, not past custom unless we're actually doing a historical document and this is simply referencing historical events um so today we would capitalize it so i think that's right i would say you could leave them together but that's up to the sponsors um they are different but okay i'm going to go on unless i see i don't see any hands i was going to so whereas as late as 1948 the first african-american faculty member hired to umass was unable to find housing for himself and his wife in the town because of their race, semicolon and. It's just a point of accuracy. Instead of saying UMass, you should say the University of Massachusetts Amherst to distinguish it from the rest of the system and the other four campuses. Thank you. Any other thoughts about that? Okay. Whereas as late as 1950, racial covenants existed in Amherst that prohibited property, uh, dash, for example, land on Blue Hills Road, dash, from being, quote, sold or rented to any person or persons of color, end of quote. And any uh, thoughts, concerns about that? Okay. Whereas in a 1964 UMass freshman class of nearly 2,000, uh, 2,500, only 12 students were of color, comma, and of those 12, eight would go on to graduate. And two years later, the entire black student population of UMass was around 50 people or about. Again, I would prefer to make this all one sentence, as awkward as that may seem. Um, that's what I would suggest. Um, so, and, first of all, it should say again, University of uh, Amherst. Amherst. Okay. In 1964, in 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 University of Massachusetts Amherst freshman class of nearly 2,500. And then I do have an updated percentage for you uh, based on um, the facts and figures of 1967 UMass Amherst. In 1966, the class was 13,679, not the class, the total student population. So your percentage is somewhere around 3.66 or 3.7. I'm not saying it's a wonderful percentage, it's just accurate. Right, no, we want, again, we're concerned about accuracy. You can round it to say 3.7. I would, yes. So wait, you, you said 12,000 population and 50 total. That's not 3%. 1% is 126. That's like 0.3%. Yeah. 
Okay, 0.3%, right. My calculator led me wrong, sorry. That's all right. Actually, so if you're, if you're going to do it that way, it should be 0.37%. Okay. So I, for the UMass thing, I um, just put UMass in parentheses up at the first one so we don't have to keep putting it out. Great. Okay. So we'll keep UMass then in, the sec in this whereas, fine. Okay. Um, okay. Lynn. Could Please, Shelly. Lynn, could you just give us the number and could we just make a note of the actual number so we don't have to go and can, look, at, look it up again? In 66, you said the yeah. population was? The total student population, including graduate and undergraduate, was 13,679. Thank you. Okay. I don't um, know where you got the 50 from. I can't find that. I mean, that's not, it's not 0.37 then, because 0.33 would be, you'd need at least, well, actually, maybe it is, never mind. I'm trying to do the math in my head. We, we can check that figure ourselves. Yeah, yeah you certainly yeah. can check it. And you want to look at this sentence and feel if you're happy with it being turned into one single thought. I prefer that personally, but we I'm not only one of five here. Um, but I prefer it be a single thought. Um, I had split it into two whereases to get it into single sentences. So, George, I'm with you. <laughs> Somehow, uh, one another, sentence per whereas. That's another option. Um, you could do that. Question. Please, go ahead, Shalini. Do we need to put citations somewhere to show where we got these facts from? I think not in the resolution itself. We don't really like footnotes and so on in the resolution. Um, but it sounds like you're going to provide an accompanying document. Okay. And, and that would be, I certainly would appreciate that personally. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but I don't think it's something that, I mean, this is an open question really for the committee. Um, one could put footnotes and, and have that you know, cited or whatever. Um, that's not something we've done in the past. I'm not sure I'm too keen on it. Um, but some kind of accompanying document would be valuable. Any thoughts from my colleagues? Do they want citations? Do they want footnotes? In this case, would it be appropriate, even though we don't know how to do put it? Them in others. Uh, it's true, we don't. But this is a rather unusual, <laughs> it's an unusual resolution, I think, in some ways. Um, it, making it a, uh, a number of historical claims, um, for instance, and uh, factual claims. Uh, I see Andy, please. Yeah, I would just go with the accompanying document idea because I think that you want the resolution to be as clean as possible. I mean, we already sort of acknowledged its length. That's correct. Some bad notes, but an accompanying document would be helpful. There, I, I really appreciate the amount of research that went into creating this. And uh, back to my uh, background as a history major, mm -hmm. uh, certainly would uh, yeah. benefit mm -hmm. from knowing what the history, how you came about all of this historical facts, but um, not in the resolution. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to move ahead. Whereas in a 1994 public meeting held in Amherst, the NAACP decried Amherst schools as, quote, lacking in teachers who reflect the students racial and ethnic makeup and insensitivity to the students concerns, end of quote. Uh, decried, yeah, this is just language now. I don't know if anybody has a problem with that. It's a bit, strikes me as a bit archaic, nothing wrong with it, it's perfectly, you know, but um, she would say, and she would criticize the Amherst schools as, or found fault with, or uh, just a suggestion, and maybe the sponsors can think about it. Um, decried is fine, but that's my only thought. Okay, any other thoughts? No, I don't see any hands, any, okay. Um, whereas, in a 2001, whereas in 2001, a diverse crowd of over 250 people, including town officials, the chief of police, local businesses, okay, maybe, okay. And members of the school and religious communities showed up on the Amherst Town Common for a quote, rally for unity, unquote, following the vandalization of a black owned store 
only five years after a similarly egregious event occurred at the same store. Comments here. Mandy. Yeah, just, just a picayune town in this one and the next whereas just needs capitalized, so I'll fix that. Thank you. Um, do you want, instead of local businesses, do you want local business owners or local business people? Because uh, a local business doesn't show up, but um, town officials show up, chief of police shows up, members of the school and religious community show up, um, local business owners, I think is what I would suggest. Um, okay. Any other it, thoughts? It Com makes yeah. me wonder whether chief of police needs capitalized because uh, it's referring to a specific individual. I would capitalize it, yes. Okay. Does black own need a hyphenation? I'm just that, I mean, this is my, mm -hmm. you know, right. My limited knowledge of the language. Okay, uh, I see a hand, Shalini. I apologize, I need to leave. I had an appointment at noon. Okay, well, thank you for being present. Yeah, and, and uh, thank you so much for this is so helpful, every one of you. Thank you. Well, you'll get the bill in the mail. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> and and just also want to thank Matty and M Michelle yeah. also for yeah. the history and all that good stuff. Thank you. Okay. And Pat, your hand is up. Yeah. Uh, minor Sorry, thing. Goodbye. Yep. Pardon me? Go ahead. I did it this time. <laughs> I'm unmuted. I think that it should say local business owners, comma, members of the school community or the school, comma, and or, and religious communities. I th I'd like to take out the end between business owners and members of the school. I don't know. Yep, okay. So community, community and religious communities. The school, I don't want to repeat community. Business owners, comma. Members of the school community comma, and religious communities, and members of, of so, okay. so if you take out the and before members of school, then you need to have separate phrases because the third phrase after business owners is members of the school and religious communities. Yes, so if you're splitting correct. them up. We need to create two distinct phrases, which I yeah, tried yeah, to ignore, do here. Yeah, no, I ignore my change. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you, uh, Mandy. Okay. Any other thoughts? I see no hands up. I see no one waving. So I'm going to go to the next. Whereas in 2015, more than 100 people gathered on the town common in support of a black Amherst Regional High School teacher, dash recognized by the district as a quote dedicated professional teacher of mathematics who provided exemplary instruction to our students, close quotes. Dash after comma according to the district, she was quote subjected to harassing and hurtful events and notes and a quote during the course of her employment. All right. Um, I don't like dashes, but um, I don't know. Teacher who had been recognized by, as, and who provided, or had recognized as a blah, 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 and who, after, who, uh, according to the district, had been, quote, subjected to, um, I don't know. Maybe you want to play with the wording here. I don't know. Um, I don't like dashes, though we have them elsewhere. So, so much for that. You put that idea with the Blue Hills Road. Yes, yes, which I also don't like there either, but that's just me. I like pronouns and commas and just for clarity's sake. So um, if you read this one last time, uh, comments for the black as a teacher, dash, blah, 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 blah. I just find it awkward. Dash, statement, dash, after, comma. Anyone else have a problem with that? Just as English, just in, in clarity's sake, whether it worked. We may not want to do it now, but I find it a bit awkward. I think it could be written a little bit more clearly. I agree, and I, we can look at that. Yeah, I would suggest using a pronoun and, yeah. and uh, get rid of the dashes. Um, and uh, we're good. Okay. 
Whereas in 2018, University of Massachusetts denounced, quote, acts of hate, intimidation, unquote, and launched an investigation after flyers and stickers from a white nationalist hate group were found posted on campus the same day uh, that author and historian Ibram X. Kendi, a leading scholar of racism, comma, visited campus and delivered a lecture at the UMass Fine Arts Center on how to be an anti-racist. Okay. Whereas in 2019 at Amherst, the median income, family income for white families was 2.4 times greater than the median family income for black families, comma, 51% of the black population in Amherst was reported as being below the poverty line, comma, compared with 30% for the white population, comma, white folks in Amherst were four times more likely to own a home than black folks, comma, but the percentage of black seniors that dropped out of school was nearly three times that of white seniors, comma, and while 40% of seniors went on to attend a private four-year college or university, comma, none of them were black, semicolon. All right, there's a lot there. Um, use of phrase white folks, black folks. That's new here. I'm not sure that it's really, it's, it's you know, perfectly natural phrase, but given the way this has been worded, I'm not sure it's appropriate or at least I think it would be better if it said whites or something like that, rather than black folks or white folks. Or people. Yeah, something like that. Um, and yeah, that's it's really same thing. yeah, I think that should be looked at. There's a lot in here. I don't know if it's worth breaking up. Um, it, it covers a lot of different ground. There's median income, um, poverty line, um, home ownership, um, and then school education. So it's kind of a mixed bag of indicators, all of which are deplorable. Um, and maybe you just leave it as it is, but um, it's kind of mixed. Uh, Mandy. Yeah, the only thing in, re I, I agree with the mixed, I think it's fine. The use of commas works, you know, instead of trying to split it up, I understand what the, what the sponsors were trying to do to shorten things, get it all yeah. in one whereas. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I had to do a double take on when I read this was when we got down to the percentage of black seniors and then 40% of seniors went on um, because I initially started reading that as like elderly seniors, not high school seniors. So I, I'll type it in here, but I would recommend adding high school seniors um, just to <laughs> clarify that we're not talking about those over 65. You know, it, it gets clear later on, but my first thought was, Black seniors that dropped out, huh? <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I wonder if it isn't worth splitting into two. I know I appreciate the desire to try and, but um, this is a, a very different point. Um, one is economic, the second is educational. And uh, it's something that the sponsors to consider. I wouldn't have a problem splitting it into two whereas is, but Andy? Um, no. And Lynn? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I also yeah. chose not to include those that went on to community colleges. And that might have been done to make a point, uh, but I question that there would be no black students that went on to two year schools and then maybe transferred with a four year. I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matthew has his hand up. Matthew, please. Yeah, I mean, I just, I was the one who did that research and yes, there were, black students that went to two-year colleges, there's no way for us to know whether any of them transferred. And the fact is that right out of school, 40% of seniors went to four-year schools and none of them were black. And I think the fact stands. So when you say private, you also mean private and public four-year colleges. No, just private, just private. Okay, then there should be a comma there. I, well. It, it, this is a hard thing to say. I understand what you're saying is they went yeah. to the private, but some of them went on to public. Yes, this make is only about private. Yeah. I mean, these are the ones that- The relevance, know. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, it's, it's highly relevant. I just want to make sure it's stated so that it's understood. Yeah. That's all. All right. Any other, I see um, no, Matthew's hand has been spoken, so um, yeah, that's all right. Um, 
again, I just suggest thinking of splitting it. But, um, whereas in 2020, following the murder of George Floyd, dozens of Amherst residents called into um, a town council meeting and shared deeply painful personal stories about racial discrimination, comments strongly urged the town to hear their concerns and bring about change. Excuse me. Thoughts about this section. Can we verify that it was in fact dozens or do we just want to say many? Uh, my memory is that we had many, we had more than 24 residents calling in at many of those meetings. So that would be multiple dozens. Okay. And each one or most of them sharing deeply personal stories about racial discrimination is the recollection. Okay. Yeah, I have my hand up because uh, yeah. I, 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 we're all recalling the same meeting. Uh, yeah. It was about, um, at least because it was really in light of, um, you know, the, the, the whole, that whole incident in Minneapolis and many other places and questions about policing and, uh, do the, uh, this is just something again for the sponsors uh, as to whether to get into the specificity that it was uh, people were talking in terms of policing. Okay. All right. Could, instead of Maybe. called into a town council meeting, it could, you know, just other options spoke at town council meetings, it might actually be stronger than called into and shared spoke at and shared. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just note it here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see you know, many of your hands up, but I think that's you just done that so good. Oh yeah, sorry. I'll That's take right. it down. That's right. You can't type and do <laughs> only have two hands. Seems like you have more than two hands to me, but yeah. Um, all right. Next, whereas whereas the Emberstone Council acknowledges the trauma inflicted on BIPOC um, by persistent. So I guess that needs anyway on BIPOC by persistent white supremacist ideology results in psychological harm, affecting educational, economic health, and social outcomes, and conjures painful memories our town's past, not only for those who lived through them, but also the generations that have followed. So that needs to be clarified one way or the other. Uh, knowledge is the trauma inflicted on our black residents, on, on Amherst black residents, on black residents, or on BIPOC residents, um, by persistent white supremacist ideology um, resulting in, is that the resulting? The trauma results in. It comes trauma that results. So Amherst acknowledges the trauma inflicted. Results in. Results in. Okay. The wording could be okay. Yeah. Um, right. you know. But I think other than that, uh, any other uh, concerns? Again, I would prefer black instead yeah. of. Yeah, in terms of that's an issue for them, but I think we've made the point many times now that that's something we need to think about. Because um, I think, quite frankly, this would come up in council discussion. Um, and part of the point here is just to alert sponsors of things that might be issues for the mm -hmm. council as a whole. So um, that's part of what we try to do. Not in terms of content, but just in terms of people raising questions of clarity, consistency. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on unless I hear otherwise. Whereas the town of Amherst acknowledges this is a partial list which represents only a small sampling of Amherst history of anti black racism. Semicolon. Oh, uh, that's it. Uh, uh, that is period, actually, isn't it? I just changed it to period from comma because it's the last whereas. That's correct. Now we have a series of resolves, and that will bring us, uh, and we are still. Um, Hanging in here for time, but now therefore be it resolved that in accordance with the fundamental principle set forth in the Declaration of Independence, which asserts that all people are created equal and are endowed with the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the Amherst Town Council acknowledges the town's history of racially motivated policies and practices 
and apologizes for the damage this history has caused the town, particularly its BIPOC residents. Again, we've made that point, so we'll just highlight that. Any comments on the language or well, anything? I, I see Andy. Like First and, quotes. Lynn, Lynn, go ahead. I'd like to see quotes for the phrase that comes out of the Declaration of Independence. And Andy. Yeah, I mean, I just, I always am um, hesitant in using the term motivation because you can't really know what somebody's motivation was. We continually get into problems there. Clearly, they were policies that um, had. Uh, racial effect, um, but whether the in, um, intent of the people who passed the policy was um, a motivation is, um, is an awkward leap to make. And I just want to point that out. Yes, um, Pat. Yeah, I would just say that I think that it we have to keep motivated there because if we look at what happened where black residents were asked to leave because they were black, you know, it, to not have that there that it's racially motivated, um, I think weakens the statement. Yep. Okay. And, and okay. I think it, it's pretty clear uh, in many of these instances, it's because the people were black that these things have been happening. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say the sponsors certainly would um, say that these were racially motivated. So um, we may question that language, but that I think would be more a matter for um, council discussion and you know larger debate. Um, but the language of the sponsors, I think the sponsors would say clearly these were racially motivated. Mandy. I was going to echo what Pat said. When you read the even just the few uh, examples the sponsors put in, it's clear that when the town selectmen order the first free blacks of record to leave town, um, and then when you know when you look at the deed restrictions, the deed restrictions are I'm trying to find the language here. Um, quote sold or rented to any person or person of color. That that to me is clearly racially motivated. Um, you know we're not taking a leap here with the language. So I don't uh, on a clear matter and a consistency matter. I don't have a problem with that wording. Yeah, I, I guess the reason that I raised it is because I, there are also policies and practices that have um, had a negative effect on um, our uh, black people and by other BIPOC residents that um, are not, yeah. you know, are not so clear, and we're not Nate, and we're not called out in the whereas clauses. So you can look at it both ways, um, but I do think that there are other policies, and that one of the things we want to do is um, examine all policies and make sure that all of our policies do not um, have a uh, adverse effect on people of color, but um, we don't know that every one of those that might have an effect on people of color were in fact racially motivated when they were passed. One question about the word history um, at the end, um, just from the point of view of what this is trying to say, it acknowledges our ideal and then it, it, it references the ideal and then says the Amherstown Council acknowledges the town's history of, oh, that's correct, no, it's all right. The town's history of racially motivated policies and practices, it's my fault, that's fine, that's fine. It picks up history from that, that's fine, sorry. Other thoughts, comments on this section? Okay, again, other than BIPOC, which I'd highlight just for the, be it further resolved that the Amherst Town Council hereby rejects prejudice and bigotry based on race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or national origin, including the idea that white people are inherently better or more worthy than any other group of people and declares that it stands against white supremacy. Mandy Joe. 
So I'm always afraid of lists um, because it's so hard to be comprehensive on a list. Um, so I guess my question for the sponsors is, is it, a, is it the comprehensive list we want? Is it the list we want? Um, is it missing anything? The one I came up with was ethnicity, um, especially if we're talking about Black and BIPOC, you know, ethnicity comes into this play, you know, in, into these conversations a lot. Um, so I, I would just ask that they look at the list further and make sure it's the list they want. My thought is similar, but also that maybe you should simply focus on the the single most important point that and that the council rejects the idea that right rejects the white supremacist idea. Isn't that the point? Isn't that the most important point? I mean, the other stuff is just you know people read that and go ho hum, right? Um, not that it isn't important, but it's like okay. But this is very explicit in identifying a particular idea that we, the council, resolve publicly that we reject it. So again, just a suggestion, would it make sense to drop the list and focus simply on the point of this belief in white supremacy? Mandy. Oh. Andy. Yeah, I just uh, get, want to get us back to the very beginning when we were talking about the title of the whole thing and what the title was. And the title was um, about called out uh, black people. And now we're getting into um, the actual what we're resolving to do. And all of a sudden, we're expanding beyond what we said in the discussion of the title. And that's why I brought up the whole question of um, consistency. And I think that's where we're losing consistency. So a question about consistency and a suggestion um, that either you reconsider the list and make sure it's the list you want, or a suggestion that you focus specifically on the issue of white supremacy, which would seem to fit with the uh, larger point that Andy's making. Be it further resolved, the Amherstown Council of Right condemns the actions, speech, and attitudes of those who promote hate against any race, ethnicity, or other base, against any race, ethnicity, or other basis in an effort to interfere with the unalienable rights of any human being and hereby declares that it reaffirms its commitment and collaboration with all residents to pursue policies and take action to ensure civil and human rights to all individuals. Well, this certainly picks up on the list above. So that's something I guess for the sponsors to consider. They may wanna keep it because this again is expansive. Um, I have a problem with other, uh, promote hate against any race, ethnicity, or other basis. I have a problem with or other basis. I'm not quite sure how that works. Maybe or on any other basis, but I, I just seem somewhat, you know. So speech or attitudes of those who promote hate against any race or ethnicity. But again, it's a tension between a sort of general and a specific. Um, but just in terms of English, I don't have, I've, just or other bases, maybe or on other bases. I don't know. I'm not, I don't get it. Patricia. Pat, you need to unmute thyself. I hate being old. Um, what I'm agreeing with the removal, I think that it should simply say um, condemns the actions, speech, and attitudes of those who promote hate in an effort to interfere with the unalienable rights of any human being. So um, okay. I would like to see that change. Okay, well, they'll make that change and the sponsors can review it. Okay. Any other thoughts? I see Alyssa, please. I was just going to say before I heard Pat's phrasing hate or any effort or attitudes of those who promote hate comma or any effort to interfere. I don't know, but we'll keep working on it. So thank yeah. you. And I know we said we weren't going to comment on content, but I think that helps address your consistency issue. All right. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, 
I'm going to go on to the next resolve. Be it further resolved, the Amherst Town Council hereby affirms its commitment to eradicating the effects of systematically racist practices of town government and town affiliated organizations. And will review and revise its policies, procedures, ordinances, values, goals, and missions through an anti-racism lens to foster an unbiased and inclusive environment that is free of discrimination, harassment, and negative stereotyping toward any person or group. We don't have ordinances, we have bylaws. Right, right. That's that was gonna be one of my comments. <laughs> my comment also. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, I, I had another comment. Please, um, the commitment, you know, and this will come up a couple times in the next few, be it further resolves. And it, it was discussed earlier. What is GOL's policy in terms of resolutions as it commits or um, creates sort of a policy that must be followed, where it creates sort of a mandatory action? Um, I know we dealt with this with the pollinator resolution. I did not look up what our, our no. fixing of that or where we came in in the end of that because, you know, affirms a commitment to is fine, but then the and will review and revise its policies, procedures, bylaws, values, goals is sort of a little bit further than just commitment to eradicating. It's, it's binding us to an action. Um, and it's not just binding us, frankly. Um, right. Well, actually, this one refers to the town council. Um, yeah. So, so this one would be only binding the town council. But, but I don't know where GOL fell finally on that question. We would not allow them to bind the council using a resolution. So, a uh, binding binding language. Um, is problematic, seems to be the thought. Alyssa. I think the thought is-, is I'm sorry, may, uh, Lynn. I think the thought is absolutely appropriate. And I will say that we've had, we have been challenged by at least one resident on this very issue. But the reality is in the past, at least we have not allowed a resolution to bind the council. Okay, Alyssa. All right, let's see, hand is down, so maybe that. Go ahead. So obviously GOL understands your guidelines better than I understand your guidelines, but part of the difference between a proclamation and a resolution, right, is a resolution says you're gonna do something. So if you're saying we can't bind anybody to do anything, then what's a resolution? I mean, I understand the concept of binding in other contexts but I don't understand what the problem is with it inside this resolution, because otherwise it would just be a proclamation that these things are true. What's, what's resolved if, are we saying that resolutions are only resolving that we say a thing, in which case then they're just a proclamation? So I'm lost. Resolutions are atta attached to uh, things that you say you're going to do. We resolve to do something, and so we, we we're going to review we're going to review policies. Maybe the revised part comes out because maybe we review them and we we we're making a commitment to review them. That's what our resolution is, and the revised part is too binding. I mean, I just don't see that we can't say anything because then the whole thing just turns into a proclamation of what we believe, not that we're actually going to do anything about it. Um, Pat. To build on what Alyssa says, it seems to me that this is an action we want the council take, to take to review, and I would say and revise, but I can understand why that might come out. But um, the council can vote not to. Yeah, right. That's it's the point of a resolution. The council decides I do want to be bound by this or I don't. Right. So. I don't see a problem, and I don't. I, I don't see a problem. Yeah, I, I frankly don't see one either. In terms of clarity, consistency, and actionability, um, the council clearly can resolve to do something, and it can also decide it doesn't want to do it and take it out. Um, but there's no reason why we can't allow it to be in here. Right. Otherwise, what's the point? Exactly. Um, um, 
further thoughts on that? Alyssa, um, your hand is up and Mandy Jo. Let me go to Mandy Jo first, then Alyssa. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think back because the biggest one we had this conversation with was that pollinator resolution, which somewhere in the Be It Resolved required the town to stop using specific types of treatment and also then required the town to do stuff on its town commons and greens and everything in support of pollinators. Um, you know, not mow as frequently and all of that. And I know the language was changed because we were concerned about essentially creating policy through a resolution instead of a clear policy document. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the question is, maybe this one's okay because it doesn't really create a policy. It just binds us to reviewing stuff. Um, and, and maybe that's, to, to Alyssa's point, maybe that's the difference is that it's not resolutions can't bind us to do something. It's resolutions aren't a substitute for a policy statement um, or a, a true policy statement. You know, when we look at what the council does with policies, you know, our public ways policy or something. Um, and so maybe this one is okay. I'm, I'm still thinking it through, but that might I, be the difference. Well, my memory at the time was that, that this involved other departments, DPW, et cetera. And we, have we're concerned that you know uh, we needed input from them or some kind of buy-in from them? I mean, it's one thing to say the council is going to do something because the council gets to directly vote on it, but here was a, a resolution that was committing a town department to action, and we had no input from the town department. We had no sense of whether this was even. I know there's actionability. Or is this, can this even be done? Is that, this appropriate, right? Yeah, that, that could have been it. Yeah, and I'm not sure what actually finally happened. I, I know we I got know we rid never of, talk, yeah. I know we got rid of the binding language. Um, I could look it up now, but it could be that we as a town council can't, we can create policy, but we can't tell a department what to do. We yeah. can't. And, and so right. this further resolve that only refers to the town council to review the town council's policies may be actionable, but a resolve that says, departments and other places on the executive side would not be appropriate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we certainly could, could, uh, yeah. All right, bodies we control, definitely. Policies we control, definitely. But for other things that involve the town manager and town departments under his control, I think all we can do is what? Exhort, request, but we can't, we can't command. Like I mean, we can do all kinds of things. Lead. <laughs> no, but I think, so um, just again, um, do we, in terms of the language here, um, what's the, what have we, what have we decided? Um, and we're gonna keep, and we'll review and revise his policies. I think we're gonna keep that language. Is that the sense of the committee on the grounds that can... otherwise, what's the point? I mean. As Alyssa pointed out, it's, this is supposed to resolve us to do certain things, and this refers specifically to things that the town council um, has control over, its policies, its procedures. Now, the rest of this values, goals, and missions, but I mean, I can live with that, but it's, um, again, I prefer something very concrete, policies and procedures. Um, um, George, I hate to say this, but I, I have a hard stop at quarter of. Quarter of, okay. Um, Let's keep going. <laughs> that was the vice chair speaking. We only have three more go. Three more. Yeah, yeah, we we yeah. will finish this document. Absolutely. We have time. We have one other item I'd like us to attend to, but we'll do what we have to do. Um, so I will shut up and let's move on to the next one. Um, be it further resolved that the Amherstown Council and staff will engage in individual and collective work to understand bias and historical role racism is played in Amherst and the community at large in order to better lead a town which is safe welcoming and equitable, a safe, welcoming and equitable place for all people. So again, this is binding language in the sense that we will engage in individual and collective work to understand bias and its historical role and the historical role racism is played. Questions about this, Mandy? So yeah, just one Scrivener one is this word town. Um, whose staff? Is it the town council staff, which maybe then we can bind, but if it's department staff and Paul's staff, we, we can't do that. So I think to be safe, I would just get rid of the words and staff. Yeah. Okay, all right. 
Okay. Be it further resolved that the Amherst Town Council is committed to engaging in a path of remedy for Black Amherst residents who have been injured or harmed by discrimination and racial injustice. Mandy. Yep. Um, so I guess this is this is the heart, I think, of what the sponsors are going for. Um, and it goes back to the binding, but what is the quote path of remedy? Um, I guess would be the question on clarity um, and and all, you know, whether the council's ready to commit, I guess is not something GOL is is something to discuss. But, but the question I would have is what does quote path of remedy mean? Um, Matthew has his hand raised. So um, intentionally, this says that a path of the, the town is committed to engaging in a path of remedy, but we're not going to define yet what that remedy is. So it's just the commitment that a path, some path, is it's time for it, it's necessary, it's possible. We're, you know, the town is is going to do that. And then what that path looks like needs to be worked out later on. But as soon as we get specific into the details of the path, uh, then it becomes a little more complicated as far as making, you know, getting buy-in and and all that. You know, this is a, as we said, like an educational document that brings this issue to the fore and invites a path forward that path will be determined in the future, but it's just a commitment to a path that we're asking for. Okay. I think in terms of, I'm sorry, uh, Andy. How about uh, the, we'll seek to remedy. I don't, how does that help? I, I kind of like a path of remedy. Um, and so I'm not, I, Andy, explain how you think this helps. How it makes it clearer or more consistent. Clearer, I guess. Yeah. Uh, plus, it, uh, because there are many, many ways to guide. Engaging is a, uh, I, I, I'm not strongly. No, it's just, okay. No. Strongly, so I'm you not. were suggesting, be it further resolved that the Amherst Town Council is committed to, again, finding remedies or re yeah, mediating. Something. Okay. Um, I don't know. I. Any other yeah, thoughts no, here? It I see, yeah. doesn't change it much. So. Yeah. <clears throat> I kind of like the language as it stands. Um, it does yeah. commit us to um, finding a way to address those who have been um, clearly injured or harmed. And that's left open, obviously, for the reasons that Matthew has, has stated. And I think it should be left open. But I think I like the idea of um, us acknowledging that um, we are committed to engaging in a path of finding a path of remedy. Andy, are your hand still up? That may be residual, if not, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll take that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm gonna, any other suggestions for that next to last whereas? Final whereas. Be it further resolved that the Emerson Council acknowledges resolution as a first step in the reparative process and understands there's substantial work to be done, which will take considerable time and commitment to meet its goal of being an anti-racist town. Thoughts on that final whereas? I actually like that whereas it gets back to the question of after our confusion about the one prior, is the one prior really adding anything to what's included, what's mm -hmm. stated in the final one? Right, what is the difference? And this is a question for the sponsors either now or for later, but it could be now. 
what is there in their view the difference between the, the next to last and last resolution? And you might want to just deal. Matthew, go ahead. Well, just the semantic difference is the first one commits to engaging in a path, and the second one acknowledges that the paths that this this is a first step to step. a longer situation. So there's an articulate semantic okay. difference between no, the two. Good, good. So we're committing to a path, and the final statement says it's going to be a, a long and and uh, substantial journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's a fair response. Um, Mandy. Yeah, um, I, I don't have anything on that. Just a few more things. Page numbers would be very helpful. Um, I'll, I'll throw it in this before I send it down. Um, and if we really are only at one be it resolved, uh, I would urge the sponsors to figure out a way to get this onto three somehow um, instead of four to you know, just one less page, even in numbering, even if it's only one resolution, not not by deleting, but by playing with margins, um, is yeah. just I or think fonts. You could play with fonts. Font or... sizing something yeah. to see if yeah. it can go on to three instead of four, since we're barely on four. But adding page numbers would be helpful too. I agree with page numbers, and I want to go back to the uh, um, supporting the right to choose resolution, which was, I think, four pages long, but I'll check that. Uh, it's just a suggestion. Um, and you're, as you've been made, made clear repeatedly now, you are perfectly free to ignore our suggestions. Um, <laughs> and uh, what I take, what we have accomplished here, hopefully has been useful. And the thought is that this would be, Mandy will send a copy of this to the sponsors and that sponsors will then meet and discuss and then they will return to us on the, uh, what is the next meeting date? December 2nd, is that right? I think it is. It's on here somewhere. I got papers everywhere. Yes, we meet December 2nd. And again, it would be in the first position, ideally, so that you would um, be, we'd deal with it first. Is that acceptable to the sponsors? We're not gonna vote on it today, I guess is the bottom line, as Mandy had suggested. And um, I think you can see why, and I think it makes sense. Um, so that's where we stand. Pat? I wanna thank uh, the members of GOL. I feel like we've clarified a lot of issues and made sections stronger. Um, and that's work that I've seen us do for the past two years, and I'm very appreciative of it. Often sponsors in the past have taken us out to breakfast, um, which is always a nice thought. You could as soon that. as COVID's over, um, honey. Uh, you know, or you could just send us a, uh, you know, like a, uh, a gift certificate from our favorite. Uh, I really like Jake's. Uh, just a thought. I just mentioned it. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, we have one brief thing I want to mention. Lynn must go in about four or five minutes. Um, so uh, our guests are welcome to leave. They're also welcome to stay if they want to see how sausage is made. But it's not a free site. Um, Thanks so, so much, you all. It's really a great process. And as they say, a camel is a horse made by a committee, but we're making a pretty nice, nice looking camel here. The further we go <laughs> along. All right. See y'all. Thank, Thank you, Matthew. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. You. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, we're going to put everything else off in the interest of time. We can wait on the minutes. Um, the uh, Lynn has worked, I think, on a revised timeline draft and she could we can look at that and talk about it at the next meeting hopefully uh, and but we do have the issue of FinCom and what we want to do and um, maybe that we don't have time to deal with that today either um, so maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing but um, as you know we've had a resignation and the question before us is whether we want to institute the process we normally would institute in this case and begin looking for replacement or whether we want to wait until the term expires. Um, and so insofar as we have time to discuss this and maybe we don't, Lynn has four minutes. So um, perhaps we should hold this off until the next meeting and people can just- We had to have a quick discussion. Go ahead. Any, well, open, the floor is open. <laughs> and Joe's hand is up. Yeah, so I would say since we're at the very beginning of a budget process, if we can get this done quick, it is definitely worthwhile trying to do it now. Um, and to that end, I would support George getting a notice on the town bulletin board out ASAP. I think we've got a procedure that he could draft it and just put it out so that we can start collecting 
anyone new interested. But it'll yeah. be an appointment only until the end of June. Right, and they're gonna have to be brought up to speed and that is something that I think um, uh, has been expressed as a concern by FinCom that given what the, the learning curve is very steep, um, we're not gonna be able to act that quickly. It's gonna take us probably a month, no matter how quickly we act. It's also the holidays. So we're dealing with, with the, the holidays, the new year, all uh, the rest of it. So George, uh, yes, Pat. I, I know I'm interrupting you, I apologize. That's quite but, all right. Uh, we did have Mary Lou Thalman on the, uh, as a resident member of the committee. It, I don't know whether it would be possible in terms of process to ask her to return, to fill out the term, to fill out Sharon Povinelli's term. I don't know that she would want to, but that seems like a, a fairly precise and cons way to, or a quick way to possibly fill that spot with someone who is knowledgeable, who is up to speed. I, I agree with you, but in the in the world we live in, often the most reasonable and best is not necessarily the friend of process and the rules and regulations. And so if we start arbitrarily appointing people to council bodies, uh, I think people would legitimately raise a question of process. Okay. So um, it's, a, it's open for the other, others of you to weigh in, but I guess I, I share with you the thought, ideally Mary Lou would be someone we, now I'm not saying she would say yes, she might very well say no, but just the process fact, the, the appearance of it would seem troubling to some, and I can't say how I could defend it. Um, either we do the process or we don't. We could delay it, um, or we need to, just, as Mandy said, we need to just act. Lynn? Um, we also had a pool of uh, other candidates that, and uh, you know, if we're gonna go back out, we should at least invite them. Yep, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it would be, it would not look good, um, even though, right, it just wouldn't look good. Um, I have no problem with starting the process, but I do think it's going to take some time. And um, we have to also question whether we're going to interview everybody again. Um, we've already interviewed a whole lot. We're going to get statements of interest from everybody again. I think new candidates, yes, but the old candidates, certainly they wouldn't need to. Um, and we, I think we relied on statements of interest alone last time, so we didn't. And we did do interviews, didn't we? Yes, we did. So these are all take time. And so we're talking at least, I think, at the earliest January sometime, I think, um, is my thought off the top of my head. And now we turn to, we happen to have the chair of finance present. Um, any thoughts from him as, a, as finance, as opposed to GOL? Um, and I think actually in the conversation, you've now hit upon all of the um, alternatives and issues that I identified as I thought through it. I am concerned as to how long it will take to do the process and um, what kind of effect somebody coming totally cold under the committee who has no background and um, has no knowledge of the budget process in trying to bring them aboard when we're trying to do everything else that the committee will have to be dealing with at the point when we are getting close to the budget being delivered. Uh, but it's sort of hard to know without knowing the candidates, whether that's going to be. Well, we certainly can make it part of our selection criteria, given the situation. It's a one year. This is only for one year. And then whoever it is would, would need to be up, would have to go up for renewal for a two-year term. So this would be a one year just filling out the existing term. Two and, well, that's another question. Yeah. So that's a question, actually. Would this be just filling out the, the term that, that uh, uh, that uh, is is vacant, which would be end in 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 uh, 2021. Wouldn't that be the case? We we wouldn't be appointing somebody for a two year point, right? We're filling a vacancy, um, right? So that's just a question. I, I could use an answer. Does it have to be two years? Wouldn't it be just to fill out the term that's that that's uh, suddenly become vacant? Just to be clear, my point is there's six, six months or seven months left on this term. Right. And any other new appointments, it's a two-year term. So 
that's not factually true. I think that. Um... Can you clarify, Alyssa? So there, there are assumptions that people are making that I can assume just as easily as someone else can assume about the other thing. There is no written policy that says when there's a vacancy, there occasionally an MGL, okay, occasionally there is a policy about this, usually an MGL, occasionally in our bylaw. There is not a town council policy that I am aware of, nor was there a select board policy that said when someone left before the end of their term, that the only thing you could do was fill out the space that was in their term. As the appointing authority, you have the ability to do whatever term length within the limits of what term lengths are based on your charge to do that you want to do. So yeah. you can tell yourselves it's only for six months because you want to do that for a reason, right? Because just like part of this criteria or because you want to plan to make you know, make the terms add up, right? So that you so that you have the overlap that we always used to talk about all the time at OCA, as well as in other spaces. But there is no, there is literally no thing associated with this appointment or any town council appointment that says we can only fill the, the, the space that's left. That would have to be a policy that was decided. It's not, it's not a factual practice in the town of Amherst that we can only fill what was left of Sharon's term. You could arguably fill the, fill the seat with any length of term that's within the charge that you have for finance committee. Okay. Okay. So could I put another Ready. option out there? Please, yes. um, well, it's actually a couple of options. To piggyback on what Alyssa said, we could advertise for the filling of the remaining portion of this term and also the next two year term so that it becomes a two and a half year term. There's nothing to say we can't appoint someone to that two year term six months in advance. Um, <laughs> you know, um, to, to do it, you know, but, but I want to also comment that if we're looking, you know, I, I am disturbed by some of these comments of we need someone with experience, we need someone with experience. Every time we use words like that, we limit our pool to those that we know of. Um, you know, it, it takes too much time to bring people up. That means we're, we're effectively saying, well, if you haven't served before, you can't serve now because we don't have enough time to bring you up to speed. And I take issue with that. Um, I take issue with that because if you remember last June when we were discussing this, we um, we had two very good candidates that we came down to and this committee was split on those two candidates. Um, and one of them did not have a lot of experience, um, but had and a lot of experience in municipal finance. Um, but, but a number of us wanted to forward that name as the appointee. And one of the things that others on this committee stated was that, well, we can look at them next year when we already have people on here that have experience. Well, now we're looking to replace one that has experience and yet we're saying, we're saying, nope, we can't have someone without experience. Um, and so I, I take issue with that. And so that brings me to my another point, which is we had a second choice in Ju July, just three and a half months ago. And um, there are many appointment and search committees that when a first choice either doesn't take it or a second uh, opening comes up shortly after those interviews were done and shortly obviously has very different meanings and you can take that anyway, go to that second choice. And so if we wanted to shorten a process, we could maybe discuss whether we wanted to just appoint that second choice um, or recommend appointment of that second option um, that, that at least two of us in committee voted um, or expressed a preference for over the one that was um, ultimately appointed. Right, I wanna build on what Mandy Jo is saying. If um, you were only looking for experience, then I shouldn't be on the finance committee. Um, I went on last year because I lacked experience in, in financing and I have still, it is a steep learning curve. But the other piece is why why are we not looking at people who have already applied? And, and in that instance, I would want to limit it to um, the six months or whatever it is that would get us to June because I'd, I'd be interested in seeing who else would apply for a full term. Uh, but I, I, whether that part is met or not, I do, do see how we can shorten the process by using people we've already interviewed. So I need clarity here. Um, 
can I go ahead, can we go ahead and simply take the existing pool, which we have and notify them um, and then simply go ahead and um, choose from that pool that we've already vetted and make a recommendation to the council and not advertise for a, uh, a filling of the position um, and make it just a six month temporary appointment. Is that what I'm hearing? I, am I, yeah, go ahead, Mandy. I think we would have to look at the requirements of the charter and our rules regarding this appointment, the finance mm -hmm. committee appointment on whether we actually have to advertise on the bulletin board for new ones or not. Um, I know the charter requires advertising for multiple member bodies. This is a separate issue in the charter. Um, and so, you know, because it's listed specifically in a different section of the charter and says the council deems how those get appointed. So we may not have to follow that typical advertise on the bulletin board for 10 days type thing. Um, but I think that's something we might not be able to resolve right now in terms of could we do it? Um, we'd have to spend some time with the relevant governing documents. Okay. So Mandy, I would turn to you for help with that if you don't mind, but uh, assuming that between Mandy and myself, we could get some clarity on that. And it turns out that we are not prohibited from, um, you know, that we can go ahead and not advertise. Um, are people comfortable with that? And secondly, are they comfortable with a six month? In other words, just filling the, the existing term or should we go ahead and simply uh, use the existing pool and fill it as we normally would with a, with a uh, well, Mandy was suggesting a two and a half year term essentially, which, um, so I need some help on that, Mandy? Um, if we're only filling a six month pool, I am comfortable with a six month, if we're only going to go right. for six months, I'm comfortable with using the existing pool. If we were going to go any longer, a typical two year term or whatever, I would want to open it up again. Okay. I'm just thinking in terms of reaching out to someone who might be willing to do this. Um, it's, it's really not offering, I mean, you, you're getting only six months and if you do not, I mean, here's where the experience argument does play a role, I think. If you really do not have a real uh, municipal budgeting experience, um, this is really kind of just almost pointless, I think. Um, uh, but if you were appointing them for, for a two year term, and then I think your argument, Mandy, is very, very strong that we, we shouldn't be simply saying, well, you can't because you don't have experience. We're gonna put you on here because you have a lot of, you know, you have promise and we like what we see, but clearly you've got a steep learning curve but two years, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll manage. But here we're talking six months, the pod process has already started. It's, it's gonna be extremely challenging and difficult. So what sense or would there be in putting someone on for six months um, who has absolutely a very little municipal budgeting experience? It seemed to be almost pointless. So that's my concern there. I agree with you, Mandy, that, that we need to stop focusing on experience, experience, experience. But in this case, if we're doing it just for six months, it seems it would be crazy to put someone on there who's had not already not not done this before. By the time they find where the bathrooms are, uh, the budget will already be, you know, out the door. Um, so that's my concern with that. And it may be just my concern, but I, I I can't see putting somebody in there for six months unless they really know what the heck they're talking about. So I see total silence. Um, well, there are two hands up, Alyssa and mine. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm looking at faces now <laughs> instead of looking at the screen. Um, Andy, please go ahead. Okay, I didn't know who you were going to call it first. Um, the experience thing. I mean, I I appreciate the point that's being made here, and I think that the way that I'm looking at the experience question is that it is a learning curve and. Um, if we're going to go to the existing pool, um, it would really not make a whole lot of sense to fill a position for a non-voting position from the existing pool, unless you recognize also that the person you're going to appoint, if they apply again for the full two-year term, is likely going to leapfrog above everybody else. And um, then you get to the question of, well, what are you then doing? 
with the next round of, uh, of appointments. And we do have to go back to what GOL uh, did. And I think it was, you know, well thought out. Um, and that was the, they said the three uh, people. So we'll have two of them uh, be appointed for two years um, and one be appointed for one year, and then you create a staggering process. And um, the staggering process worked uh, until now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we're, if we're gonna, uh, so, and, and I think that the other thing that, that's on my mind is that uh, if we do, if we do a full process now, we're committing ourselves to two full processes this year because Hegner's term expires at the end of June. Right, right. What about the argument of simply leaving it vacant? This is a uh, not a vote, these are non-voting members. You have two people with experience and um, who I assume are working just fine. Maybe we just let, just leave it vacant until we come to the end of the uh, budget process. And then we fill two positions. We fill, um, Hagner, assume if he reapplies or if he doesn't, we'd be filling two positions at that point. Um, why, why do we need to feel the need to, to fill this position? Why can't we, well, this is suggested we pretty much can do whatever we want as long as it doesn't uh, violate the, uh, the charter, the provisions of the, of the committee, um, the, the committee's charter charge. So why don't we just leave it vacant? Just leave it as it is. She stepped down, it's unfortunate, but they have two resident members. Who would complain and why would they complain? What would be the objection? So I, I guess I go back to the purpose of the resident members. And there's, uh, as I've said, from my experience on the Charter Commission, there was a dual purpose. Uh, one of which was getting people involved in council work in sort of a low commitment, new manner so that they who may be thinking about running for council later on can get an idea of what we do. Um, and now's the perfect time to bring people in that might be doing that for six months on a finance committee because next summer we're running for office. Um, and so if you've got someone, you know, from that, from that point of view, I wouldn't want to leave this vacant because you might actually be able to bring someone in that might be thinking about more involvement in town in other ways, not just council, but school committee, library trustees were all up for election in a year. Um, and this six months of experience for someone who's like, well, what would it be like? What, what's this, what's that? Could be enough to encourage someone to get more involved in an elected position um, next summer. And so why would we lose that opportunity by leaving something like this vacant for at this point, seven months, you know, we're not even in December yet. So well, I, I don't support leaving it vacant. Okay. Other thoughts on that? Because at the moment, that's what I would suggest, leave it vacant. There's no, no reason to fill it. The two resident members are fine. The third one is not going to add much. Um, and given that we're going to have to fill uh, the, the position at the end of in, in summer, um, we'll just do two. So I need to hear from my other committee members. And um, and I'll do whatever you say. I mean, um, it sounds like the other option is we advertise or not, and we or we just use the existing pool and don't advertise. Um, and is it a six month or is it a two year or a two and a half year? These are all things I need clarification from from you, so I know what to do. Um, um, maybe we need to think about it and come back to it um, next meeting. I'm sorry to be going in and out, but I would actually agree that we should fill the position. Okay. If the best way to fill the position is six months with an option for renewal, that's fine. So that's two that we'd like to fill the position right now. The chair is currently feeling that he just as soon, because he's lazy, no, he's, he just as soon leave it unfilled. Um, I need to hear from my other two members. Um, would they like to have it filled uh, now and or not? Excuse me.
Right now it's two to one. And I just need to know what to do. You're muted, Pat. That's Everyone intentional. <laughs> I see. Was that directed at me personally or is that just no, a general don't remark? Make assumptions, no assumptions. <laughs> What's your I, thought? Yeah. I guess I will go, I will say that we should fill it because there was something we don't know what that person will bring and whether they're experienced or not experienced, they may bring something extremely beneficial okay. because of they're thinking out of the box or they could bring something detrimental. Uh, and that's true for anybody who comes on any committee. So I, I would say that we need to fill the position, okay. but I would bow to what Andy sees as a need. So it, it's already, that seems to be a majority. Andy, I'm not going to slight you here, but um, it seems that the majority uh, would like to fill it now. Next question is, do we advertise? Or do we just take the existing pool from the previous uh, uh, iteration and contact them and um, arrange or just see who's interested, see if anyone's willing to reapply? Um, and under the terms of only six months? I don't know what a prospect of renewal yeah, means. Because he wasn't the speaker, so let's just hand up for, because it was up from before. No, I think it's up because you'd like to speak, and I just have been watching you guys instead of the screen. So please, Alyssa, go ahead and speak. No, I 100% wanted to make sure you got through that conversation. This is your meeting, absolutely. I just wanted to offer the perspective of having been filling vacancies for over a decade and yes. also having been through the process, right, George, that we worked on so hard. Um, I want to just remind you that while you have some options, you tread carefully when you make decisions on things like one, whether or not to fill the vacancy, I would think that would be something you would need to justify to town council. Well, we've resolved that problem today, so yay. You also need to talk with town council about a decision to just go back to your previous pool or to just offer it to your second person. These are not decisions that have previously been town council practice. Just because we split up the appointment ability does not mean every committee can just do whatever it wants. Unless, of course, what you'd prefer is to bring the appointment to town council and have it get voted down because they didn't like your process, right? So we've had that conversation how many times? Um, if you want people to do what you want them to do in terms of your appointments, then you need to bring them along in the process. So if you're making a decision as a committee that you're gonna use the existing pool and you're not gonna advertise because legally you're able to do that, you're still gonna to have to justify that to the town council. And I'm gonna argue that you're not bringing in people into town government the way the charter intended that we bring people into town government and that we continually talk about in other areas. I do think that you have the ability without having to like feel like you got permission to go ahead and say, I'm going to be fit. We're going to be filling positions for this, the, the other position that expires in June, which of course that person can reapply, but that way you only have the one process, right? But you just go ahead and post the process and get moving with it because if you do any variation of handing it to the second person, deciding not to fill it, deciding to do a different process than you've used before, you're not going to be likely to not have a problem when you get to town council, even if you still get a majority vote. Just okay. process issue. Okay. Uh, so I. I was going to say something similar. I think we should advertise. If we're going to fill it, I think we should advertise. Um, and I think we should couch that advertisement in as broad a sense as we can to give us as much leeway. So don't couch it as for a term to expire just in June, thir June 30, 2021. Um, you know, maybe we don't even have to say a term, you know, and that would give us the option of a six month term, depending on who applies. Um, you know, you could go start with the ones we already have, but we advertise we might get new, but you start with the ones that have, uh, whatever our process is, I think it's a three year look back, um, see if they're still interested and say we're looking at potentially just six months, but maybe we're going to look at two years, maybe we're going to look at six months plus the upcoming term of two years, maybe we're going to look at a year and a half instead of two, you know, um, all sorts of, you know, instead of, 
I know CRC has run into the problem where it says we're going to a point for this amount of time and then we get pushback if we don't. So I would, that term length, I would keep as broad and unclear as possible as we talk about clarity, keep it unclear um, mm -hmm. and, and say, we've got a vacancy we're getting out that advertisement so we can move as quick as possible, but we don't know what the, and how long this is gonna be um, at this point. And okay, I would have you as yeah. chair start contacting right. the ones that right. are in that pool already to see if they're still interested. So what I'm hearing here is, if I may summarize, is that um, we're gonna follow our usual policy, usual procedure. Um, and I'll put out the advertisement, I'll contact those who are, uh, have, are still in the pool and see if they're interested. And we'll go. We'll do the usual process, and report back to you at the next meeting as to what I've uh, what I've done and what I've learned. And we will fill this position. We will not determine the length um, until we actually have the pool of candidates in front of us, and we look at them and we we have some options there. Um, if we do whatever decision we finally make, the council will have the final say. If they don't like what we've done, they can certainly vote against. But at least, as Alyssa points out, we will follow our usual process and done things the way we normally do them and won't be second guessing or, or taking any shortcuts or blah, blah, blah. And uh, that's where I, I'm hearing we're at. So um, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to, as soon as possible, get the advertisement out and I will assemble the existing pool and contact those in it and uh, let them know that we have a vacancy that we are planning to fill. I assume that we do not have to have them write a new statement of interest, but they're perfectly free to do so but we're comfortable with using their old statement of interest, I'm assuming. Um, obviously new candidates, we would require a statement of interest. I'm also assuming that we would again do interviews, um, which means we would interview anyone who was a viable candidate, we would arrange for an interview. Um, we would not say, well, we just interviewed you uh, six months ago, so we're, we don't need to have a face-to-face -face interview. Um, now we could change that, that's perhaps minutia, but that's, I'm assuming we're gonna follow the usual process. Okay, this is very helpful. I appreciate it. Um, appreciate Alyssa, you're willing to stick around and give us the benefit of your No, seriously, the benefit yeah, of your Yeah, really. Um, because yeah. as you know, um, some of us, good. Okay, so um, we have many other things. Well, not many, but a few other things we're gonna do, but we're way over time. I'm grateful for all of you for sticking in there. But before yeah. you adjourn, I just Please. want you for the minutes to acknowledge that ah. there's no one in the audience for public comment. Thank you. Um, I did neglect to do that, but yes, I noticed there had been no one in the audience throughout the entire meeting, but thank you very much, Mandy. Um, and we'll leave the minutes. The minutes are in your packet. When you get a chance someday in the future, you can look at them, but we'll deal with those next time. And uh, all right. That was See you later. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, George. Thank you, Emily, for sticking around. Yeah, yeah good.